All right. All right. So we record. So I'll try to uh, do my best to have my most beautiful voice because today in this uh, beautiful small corner of the internet, I have a very special guest and I will explain why he's a very special guest. So the gentleman that you probably can see right now uh, was one of the first two guys that I saw when I started uh, my biohacking and self-exploration journey uh, back in uh, probably 2012 or something. Back in the day, the other guy was Dave Asprey. And I, th I think I saw you two guys doing something about the bullet of coffee or whatever. <laughs> and of course, when I saw you, I thought to myself, this guy has an advantage over other guys. He's a handsome guy. No homo, but uh, it's true. And then he starts speaking and I'm saying, I thought to myself, why is he in the healthcare industry anyways? He should probably be a musician. And then, <laughs> and then, and then you explain at some point that you were actually <laughs> doing music. <laughs> Yeah, I was very uh, impressed, very impressed because it's not very often that I bring a guest here that combines different modalities of life and explores different things at this kind of at the same time. So today, guests, uh, my friends and dear viewers is, uh, of course, Abel James. If you don't know him, you should be ashamed of yourself. So Abel, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Dean. Yeah, it's my, honestly, let's be honest, it's my pleasure and my honor. Uh, you're very kind. <laughs> and I thank you for that. I have many questions for you to ask, and I, I, I hope that we can uh, wander today around and on health and music. So how these two tie together. And music is also one of my loves. I'm not a musician per se. I know how to play the piano, kinda. And I'm a terrible uh, voice actor. I, I, can, I, I can't sing. So other people, when I sing, say that it's a little bit uh, a horrible experience. <laughs> so I hope to do that I learned something from you and the viewers, of course, about uh, singing, music, and health. So let's start with your background. Let us know your background as a trainer, musician, and all that good stuff. I grew up in the Northeast of the United States in kind of a rural part that was very much in the woods in, in, uh, in an old farmhouse. And we grew up kind of like in between worlds where my mom was a nurse practitioner, my dad, a, a stonemason and, uh, did some physical labor and manual labor, that sort of thing. And, uh, from a young age, uh, I was, I became allergic through through illness and the experiences that happened after that, allergic to almost every antibiotic. And uh, my mom, who was a nurse practitioner, didn't know what to do with me. And my brother, too, this happened to. And so she she went into the research and started going deep into old wives' tales and wild crafting and um, herbalism and eventually wrote a book about herbs and how to incorporate those into clinical practice in Western medicine. And uh, so <laughs> me and my brother were kind of on the other end of this growing up. And it was weird because sometimes if we went into um, the hospital or the emer emergency room, it was very, very different, even though our parents were a nurse, than the types of treatment that we were getting at home. And then, of course, when I went to school and college and tried to excel through that, mostly because we were broke and wanted to do it quickly and all of that, when I got my first job, I wanted to prove that that was all wrong and, and that there was something better out there, especially if you went to the best doctors out there. And so right after college, I got a job in consulting in Washington, D.C., and for the first time, I got great health insurance. And so I tried to use it as much as I could. And the good part of that was that I was going in every two weeks and testing my blood and urine. And I kind of learned how to read it and researched the different numbers that we were testing and why those and why this. The bad part was that over the course of the next 18 months, they all got significantly worse by following my doctor's advice. My new doctor was, was supposed to be the best, you know, and I have this great health insurance and it's all paid for and I'm going in all the time. It's, it's just worse and worse and worse. But here I am in my early 20s dealing with super high triglycerides, high blood pressure, problems with my thyroid. I was getting sick all the time. I was gaining a lot of weight. I was probably 30. I wasn't massively overweight, but probably 30 pounds uh, overweight and not as much muscle as I should have had, despite the fact that I was still working out a lot. I was you know, an athlete growing up, 
nothing major, nothing elite level at all. But I was, I always loved being physically active and I was still running 20, 30 miles a week and was my, my health was just taking a nosedive. And, uh, so that's, that's when I lost everything, long story short, lost everything in an apartment fire <laughs> and had to really examine where I was at and where my health was at and r realize that with my whole life out of my control, I had to be honest, looking in the mirror and being like, you're kind of fat, you're whatever you're doing isn't working, man. You know, you've been doing it for a while. And also I was changing jobs around the same time. So like big, big changes. And I'm like, all right, let's try to do this health thing and, and apply all of all of the energy, all of the pain. Let's try to transmute that into some sort of growing experience where I can learn from it and I can try to get better. And then it was just like all of the things that my doctor had been telling me lived in this world and the other world of the people who were in their 60s and 70s and still really fit and athletic and strong uh, and not carrying extra weight or these these natural bodybuilders and these physique athletes and olympic athletes and all these people they're not doing what my doctor was telling me at all is what i learned they're doing in fact many many things that are the polar opposite and so anyway that made me mad enough once the weight came off pretty much all my my health problems back in my 20s evaporated within months uh, and got off all the meds that my doctor had put me on and so I, I was just mad enough to start up uh, a blog and then a podcast and I called it fat burning man kind of a silly play on words and then I, I just wanted to interview people who knew n equals one type experimentation and others who could reconcile the world of research and, and, and then bring that also home to musicians and see how we can help with performance because all of these things are not different in my mind. If, if you get tendonitis from playing soccer too much or football too much, tendonitis that manifests from playing too much guitar with bad form or playing too fast or playing too much and not getting proper recovery, it's the same deal. So there are a lot of different things that these different worlds can learn from each other. Wow. Um... Or, or so we have a lot of things to unpack here. So um, you said many things that I have to comment on. Uh, let's start from what you said about um, your mom, right? So your mom, you said that she tried new things, right? So she tried and, and wrote a book. So uh, what was it that, do you remember exactly the medicines and all that good stuff that she used? Uh, specifically, do you have any idea what that was? Uh, and uh, also the healing regimen. So how, because there are different modalities, I know from traditional medicine and herbs, herbal medicine. So what was your philosophy kind of? Yeah, it was, it was more old things than new things. And in a lot of ways it came from a house guest that that my parents had over who cooked them as, as I recall, this is a story that, you know, I'm kind of shortening and it's been a few years since I've heard it, but I, I believe he cooked them their like first excellent curry that they'd ever eaten. And he had spent a lot of time in the East and other parts of the world, looking into Chinese medicine, looking into how food can heal, looking into different roots and herbs, that type of experience through food and through, you know, smelling it and taste and, and the different sensations, something connected with them. And I think that kind of set off an exploration where you always need to be learning about this stuff. Yes, there are many ancient remedies. Some of them don't have established published science, but nothing did originally. And so if we want to find all of the best ways forward, all the different things that can heal us, it's surprising to learn that many of them are growing right in our backyards and, and many of the indigenous knew this. It just went underground or this, this was lost. And you can tell actually living where we are in Colorado, we're up at 8,000 feet of elevation and the tr some of the trees up here are very, very old, thousands of years, many of them hundreds of years old. And it's, it's very obvious that they've been manipulated by humans hundreds of years ago to grow in different ways, to point to water, to mark trails. They would remove uh, sometimes the bark and the cambium uh, to, to get at the source of fat there and the source of nutrients from the cones and the berries. And we know a few different people in, the, in our neighborhood here who have become friends who make 
hydrosols and make all sorts of different healing tinctures, bombs, salves, like whatever you could imagine extracting from a plant and then turning into a medicine or a food or a smell or, or a feeling. Uh, many of the people here have been doing for many years and, and, and still are doing. It's just kind of this underground world that hasn't been well integrated with the world of preventative health and certainly not Western allopathic medicine. It's really not hooked in there unless they take a, which is commonly the case, they find a plant compound, learn how to synthesize it, patent it, and then can sell it for some exorbitant sum of money. Pine pollen, which grows right here, is one of the best supplements you could ever take, especially wildcrafted from a place close to where you live. And that's another thing that we learned is that when you're eating foods that are local and having uh, medicines or, or plant medicines that are local, it hooks into your biology much better. And the ancients knew this. The ancients knew this. It's just somehow we forgot. When you eat foods that come from there, the DNA is closer to yours. It, it's, it's a cue that tells your body, for example, to adapt to living at high elevation when you're eating plants that only grow at high elevation. And so when you can start to, to hook these worlds up of eating and medicine and, and seeing food as something that could hurt you or heal you and seeing also nature as a teacher and nature as the thing that we should really be humble about and honest about, can we really get the better of nature and outsmart it in this way and that way. I think there are ways to honor nature and also not try to trick it at the same time. And so that's, that's what I try to do from, from all the people in my family who were great examples and the friends along the way. And some of the people who live here, uh, now I, I, I think that I didn't come up with any of this. This is more just kind of an underground world, uh, that shouldn't be so underground, I believe. Thanks for the information there uh, about the pollen and about the barks and the mountains. So I find it funny though, Ab, Abel, that um, I'm not going to say you Americans because it's uh, so over generalization, but we here in Greece, let me say that we here in Greece, the word indigenous, it doesn't make any sense because we here, we always were here. Right. Right. <laughs> so we are indigenous in fact. For me, for example, I, my mom is from a mountainous region here in Greece. It's called Epirus. Uh, I don't know if you want, do you know Pyric Victory? Pyric Victory? Sure. Yeah. Uh, the term is yeah, about yeah. when you, yeah, when you win and you don't win really. Uh, the guy, the Pyrus guy was the king of Epirus. So I'm from that uh, place oh. and it's mountainous and yeah, 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 that's, that's the story there. Uh, he was a dumb king, so whatever. Uh, he was trying to imitate Alexander, so yeah. And he died from a rock falling to his uh, head. So <laughs> not the smartest uh, people there uh, from where I come from. But uh, my grandmother, my mother, my aunts, my uncles, my the the whole the relatives, all the relatives there, they know how to gather, you know, chamomile, so from the street. Yeah. Uh, they know how to gather uh, sage tea. They know how to gather mountain, Greek mountain tea, which is something that I should probably let you know about. It's a beautiful tea. It's, it grows in Greece and I think in, in a few places here in the Balkans. Tasty, uh, sweet and very healing uh, if you want to check it out later. Wonderful. And they know about all these things. Yeah, please check it out. It's beautiful. I'll send you info. Um, but they know about all these things. It's it, it's natural. My my grandmother is now ninety, probably ninety one, and she can uh, lift like twenty kilos a time. So she's very strong. Uh, wow. Naturally so, and her mom was and she still lives and works. She's like ninety one, ninety two, and she moves. She's, she's she's like a regular, you know. Uh, you know, she's stronger than my mom at some point. My mom goes there. She's like sixty. And my mom has also great uh, genetics, so from that uh, place. And all these ladies back in the day, uh, the generations, her mom, her grandmother, my grand-grandmother, they lived up to 105, 100. Wow. It's, it's crazy. And what they did was basically smell the fresh air. It's uh, up in uh, how many feet? Uh, in meters, it's like... Uh, thousand and hundred and fifty uh, meters up the okay. mountain yes, so that's the altitude so i guess it's like four thousand feet i don't know 
three, uh, something yeah. like that. It's not very high like you guys. But, you know, they live poorly and they live with a lot of herbs, a lot of herbs, and they pick the herbs with their own hands. So <laughs> a foreign uh, thing for all of us city, not yeah. you, but me, <laughs> city rats. So <laughs> and you can feel a difference, Abel. You know, when you get something fresh, a herb fresh, it's so different in taste and in how it feels in your body. It's so much different. And that's my attraction to nature. That's why I want to go back in my to, to find my roots and start living out in uh, nature. So I'm, I'm I'm really glad that you are one of these guys uh, that you preach healthcare, but you also are in touch with it. So you try to you seem to try to get to your roots and you to really live like that, not just preach like that. Because I've seen many people preaching, 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 and buying supplements only but living in the cities and i understand that but i don't know what do you what do you think about cities before we go to the music what do you think about cities do you think that in a big city a person can really find the same solutions for his body mind and spirit like in a rural area yeah that's an excellent question i think it's possible but it's probably a lot more difficult and you have to be in the right spot or the right part of the right city for that to work. And so in, in our example, I met my wife in Austin, Texas, and that place when I got there in around 2008 was still felt quite empty. And it felt like nature was uh, a big part of that city. But, you know, when we, uh, we, we traveled all around North America and, and flew around the world too, but mostly uh, North America and tried living in a bunch of different places. And so we left Austin, then we went back to Texas and by the time we got back and, and lived there again around 2017, um, you couldn't recognize the skyline. The people who lived there didn't care about Texas or the culture. A lot of them, they didn't have the accents anymore. And they didn't, like, you might as well be living in Los Angeles or New York. It just didn't. didn't and all of these buildings were suddenly towering over... Um, the parks that used to be kind of the main attraction of the city and, and the places where people hung out. And instead of families hanging out there and like people going running, there's a big festival over here and it, it costs $25 and there's a big festival over here and it's loud and, and there are planes everywhere. And I'm just like, wow, that happened fast. I, you know, we, we loved that city and it felt so different when we came back that we only lived there for about another year. And then we're like, you know what? And, and this is a big factor. I think it's important that people be honest about it because it's not always easy. Uh, and it's never really easy to move from a city to a rural environment or vice versa. Um, but my wife, Allison, was from California and Arizona originally in the, in the southern part of the U.S. And so very warm compared to where I came from uh, in New Hampshire, which was, you know, long long winter not very much sun lots of snow and ice and i'm just like well i don't know how much she's gonna like this winter thing and especially elevation and all that but let's split the difference and let's let's see about colorado because that's that's still in the south but it's it's up high where we are and so you get a really nice summer but you get a harsh intense winter like we got uh, a blizzard in june of last year and a blizzard I think at the end of August, at the beginning of September for Labor Day. <laughs> so it was like the shortest growing season you could possibly imagine. I think that year the, the growing season was as short as the Arctic short circle. It was, it was that bad because of all these storms that just came at different times. But turns out because of the exposure to the sun here more than anything else, um, my wife loves it. I love it too. It, it gets cold in the winter, but we pretty much keep our – some level of tan, some level of sun exposure year round. Even if it's cold, you can still, if you can bear it and the wind isn't too bad, go out for a few minutes every day and get sun exposure and get that those circadian cues going, which are so important to making sure you sleep well and your appetite is hitting at the right time in the right way. And so, yeah, I, it's difficult to make that move, but once we did, there's... We can't imagine ever moving back to a city again. We're really happy that we did. I think for music, for art, for meeting lots of other people, for experiencing things that you don't have in the place where you are, for learning what other cultures are like, it's so important to go to cities and spend some time there at some point. 
I don't know that now is the time. It's certainly not for us. Like we're not in a rush to go and hang out um, in in cities right now or in places that are too urban. Looking at survival, looking at raising a family in the next uh, you know few decades, which hopefully we're going to be able to do. Nature is just a paradigm that has worked for so many generations as for us as humans that it's hard to argue that that's a just a great way to live a great way to experience life and a, a great way to get away from the bad parts of the city and right now for us the bad parts of a city are outweighing the good parts especially if if things continue to be shut down or if music isn't something that people can really enjoy together and dancing isn't really a thing well then maybe we'll go out for a nice hike then in the meantime until things calm down a little bit. And you have to do the right things at the right times. But it, no matter where you are, you know, fire up a map and look for a green part of it and go there. Try to go there every day and try to experience some amount of nature. Even if you are in the worst cities imaginable, there's still a way to uh, to work nature into your life. I, I think, you know, and, and once you get outside of the U.S., it gets a lot better you know, visiting um, Thailand and, and some other place like Indonesia, Japan, of course, which I haven't been to, but having nature built into the house, having rocks around and, you know, just beautiful stones as part of the architecture is something that we have in some places here. Some, some cities and communities kind of have that. Some communities have a greenhouse instead of a pool at every house, you know, some, instead of being built on a golf course, they're built around farms, like, where we live now. And so there are always choices that you can make to get a, that, that get you a little closer to where you want to be, but you have to make sacrifices to get there for sure. Yeah. It's, it's a very interesting uh, subject because uh, like you said, you know, I was listening carefully at uh, everything you said and more or less I'm at the same page with you. So first of all, let me address the finding green in the cities. For example, I'm, I'm in Athens, I'm in uh, the capital of Greece. As it happens, uh, I've chosen to live in the northern suburbs. So I made that choice here, which is, uh, let's say it's a more affluent area of the city because the city center is really unbearable here. It's horrific. So I don't know, have you been in Greece ever? I haven't, no. No, I would really like to. Oh, damn. I've spent quite a bit of time yes. in Europe, but not Greece yet. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, so when you come, uh, let me know to send you a few places to go with your wife. Absolutely. Uh, e even when you have your own personal deadline, <laughs> you can hire an, an, an air pilot uh, because uh, I don't know if it's possible to travel with all these things. But, uh, you know, I find here a parks, for example, I go to, to exercise every few days and I go to the park. I never exercise here at home, although I have the equipment. So I have the, the rack, I have the kettlebells, I have um, everything. But, um, you know, I feel when I go to the park, you know, Abel, I, I look at the sky because here in Europe, something that most Americans don't understand, especially city Americans, is that we don't have tall buildings really. So most uh, most European cities do not have very huge skyscrapers and that. It's very yeah, and uncommon that. unless you go to the center of London or something. Right. And, uh, and that's that. And center of Barcelona, a few, a couple of uh, skyscrapers, and that's that. So uh, everything else is more or less, you know, Europe is very ancient. So we have ancient buildings mixed with uh, neoclassic buildings and with modern buildings. But... Most of them, thankfully, are really not that tall. So, especially with Greece, we, we are blessed here. And I think that you would love the place. We have a lot of sun. Athens and southern Greece, a lot of sun. So when I go outside, I put my, you know, my feet on the grass, my, on the dirt, and I have my olive trees around at the park. We have olive trees, we have other things. A small park, but it does the work, you know. It, I also get my shirt off, so I do my, my sun... Uh, exposure that way and I really enjoy man uh, I can say to you and to my viewers and to everyone listening that it changed the 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 whole game for me so I put on a lot of muscle the last year nice. since the whole charade started from uh, March 2020 for the past one and a half year 
because I think I, I did that change, I went outside, just maybe because I wanted to protest all this madness, and I went outside without my shirt, and I went to the parks and lifted them kettlebells. And Perfect. The feeling of, of, yeah, 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 the feeling of doing that in nature, feeling the wind, feeling the sunshine, and lifting things, it was very easy, very enjoyable. Mm-hmm. And I, I haven't, uh, and and since then I cannot, I really, I can't go to gyms anymore or to to lift here in my home. I can't. I feel like uh, like a rat in a cell, in a, you know, I feel like a prisoner. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, yeah. I, I will say I do work out inside with strength based stuff most of the time, but it's next to a giant window next to a door that's like looking at our garden. It's it's kind of inside outside as long uh, as well as this studio. I can't really move this, but here, giant window looking at the mountains and the garden. And over here, the deer walk by during interviews all the time. And uh, the birds uh, Crazy. get fed in these trees right here. And I'm looking down at, at, at the valley to the mountains that are probably... 70 plus miles away from here because the visibility is great today. And it's just when you can build that in, I have to do interviews inside all day. It'd be really hard to do it outside, especially with the wind and stuff. So for those people who do have to live and work inside, there are ways to kind of get the outside inside again, or, or at least choose a place, choose a, choose a house, choose a workplace, choose an office that allows you to have that option that allows you to, have a little cafe or a little sunroom or, or some place next to the window. We don't need to settle for being rats in a cage. And when you're working out, same deal. Like I like working out and looking at the trees, <laughs> you know. And then, of course, every week at least, and usually much more than that, I'll go up into the mountains and, and go pretty deep. And a lot of times that'll be a big workout, or sometimes it'll just be a casual hike with with my wife and the dog. But having that integration with nature allows you freedom from all of the technology, all of the the noise of the modern world really goes away and it starts to matter so much less. That's what we realize, we realize when we're up on the mountain or when we're deep in the woods, who cares about social media? Who cares about whatever work you have to do next? And And that is healing. When you're able to experience that freedom, that is totally healing even if it's just for a little bit of time because we all have to go back and we get we get back to work we have to go inside we have to do things we don't want to do but you have to balance that out and that's what will keep you alive amazing i agree thousand percent so yeah i leave it to that i mean it was credible a beautiful said so let's go to the music since uh that was my intention but i mean you are a person of uh, not many hats but you can talk about many things as you just demonstrated so all right so you play music so tell us about your music background for a bit and then we can talk music so how do you come and you know get involved with uh, the music uh, industry or the music yeah music was something where i feel like i'm a musician first and nothing else would have happened if it hadn't been for that. When I was, uh, I think I was eight years old, really shy kid. And I didn't, I mean, I, I had friends, but I was, I was really shy and I didn't want to go up in front of people and perform or, or anything like that. But once for, for whatever reason it was like when I first started playing clarinet and then saxophone and, and started getting into creating music instead of just listening to it, I felt I just fell in love with the the feeling, the sound, the taste of the reed. It was just like I can't wait to like play this again and learn. I think what I really enjoyed was I was able to see that I, if I put in the work, I got better. You know, if I put in a lot of time and enjoyed my time with it and tried to have a practice of of growth through discipline and through hard work and through playing, that combination of things was so fun. That was just so fun for me as a kid. And uh, so eventually, you know, at like at eight years old, my um, a music teacher in the area like brought me out and, and we played at a bunch of local diners and I would play these old Dixieland songs on the clarinet and the saxophone and I wore a bow tie. And so that kind of became my uh, connection point to my family 
during family functions, you know, I'd, I'd start playing Christmas music uh, for people and then with people. And, and over the course of doing this for a few years, my dad uh, learned how to play the banjo in his 50s after we left the house. And my mom learned how to play the acoustic stand-up bass. They've been playing for the past 10 plus years. And like the whole family started kind of playing music at, at family functions instead of sitting down and watching movies or kind of going to games or going out to to the restaurant we would make food at home and we would just play music with each other not every single person but a lot of people and then as it relates to you know what I do now I wouldn't have the technical expertise to especially 10 years ago know how to use all the equipment and microphones uh, and technology to get my podcast out there if I hadn't been releasing music since I was a teenager even before that um, but the thing that happened was that you could no longer monetize art. And that also happened. My, my older brother is a very, very talented visual artist. So I have a lot of um, sympathy and a little bit of empathy as well for people who are in the visual arts field where it did seem that, that in the years past, there was a path for people to be career artists. Yeah, maybe you'd have to take side gigs and, and stuff too, but you could make it work and you could still spend most of your time or the vast, a lot of your time working on your, your art or your music uh, or your dance or whatever it may be. And that that's really changed because it is, uh, for the people who have signed the giant 360 deals with mega corporations, for those people, yeah, they can they can probably make a living, but you'd be surprised to learn that like even the, the giant celebrities don't do as well as most people would expect. The people who are putting lots of music out there tend not to be that well compensated. And that's kind of true in, in a lot of the artistic fields. So I think it's, it's extremely important to bounce back and forth between whatever your craft might be and whatever kind of the hobby might be. And those can flip back and forth. For me, I started health as the hobby. Music was the profession. I was playing 300 plus shows a year. And, and yeah, I was taking side gigs, doing research and writing and doing other stuff too. But, uh, but the music has always been a piece that teaches me about other things. And I, I didn't make that up. You know, that's kind of built into a lot of the major philosophical, philosophical traditions where you learn from one thing, everything. And so I think that, that music fitness, health, um, anything, uh, anything that's a craft, anything that you can build and get better at is a great use of your time and energy. And it's going to teach you about everything else in your life. If you let it, if you, if you really work on it, you don't just coast, you don't just hit that plateau and then play the same song for the rest of your life. No, you have to keep going. Yeah, I agree. I agree. The progress is uh, paramount. And I was I was basically having the same conversation yesterday afternoon with my brother. He was a little bit down, you know, a little bit uh, not depressed, but uh, you know, he had his blues, his winter blues. And I was telling him that uh, you know, uh, I think that your problem right now is that you don't have some progress, so you don't mm -hmm. have something to build on. And that was right, probably because yeah, that was his main problem. And you know, we have a plan to fix that. So, yeah, I, I, and also I find that uh, music and dancing and all this expression of uh, sounds, frequencies and energy, in, so, in some sense, you can argue that music, melody are basically energetic frequencies. And uh, yes. in, in some sense, and that's where I want your professional opinion now, actually, what do you think about proper and not proper frequencies and i'm asking this because you said about the music industry and not and, and people not get compensated very well and i've heard the argument that the music industry especially since the, the mafia times so especially since the 1930s and 19 especially 1967 after the elvis after elvis and uh, all that good stuff that many companies they don't care that much about how the music is produced and the quality of it as much as they care to control and to create music that sells yeah. in a way. So what do you know about that? And do you believe that frequencies play a role? So that are there bad and good frequencies in music? Yeah, great, great questions. 
So there's a long tradition of uh, the musicians being commandeered and, and their whole careers controlled. And it didn't start with Spotify. It didn't start with the internet. It's It's been going on for a very long time where, you know, art has been built to be popular or built to be sold. And the person who's getting the most from selling it, which usually isn't the creator of that art, tries to shift the products of the artist into that direction of just what's going to sell, what's going to ruffle fe feathers, what's going to be edgy, what's going to be sexy, what's going to be blah, 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 blah. And uh, that is totally fine. Like there, uh, I think it's important to say that a lot of, a lot of great music and a lot of great art, in fact, has been um, pumped out that way, that that can be a means to make some pretty, pretty cool stuff. But for, the artist, you kind of have to ask yourself, why are you doing it? And that brings us back to our earlier conversation. It's just like, how do you make money from doing this? And as long as you take that side hustle or a job that can get your bills paid, I don't think it's necessary that that people try to squeeze um, all of the money out of their art, you know, especially if it doesn't fit. So giant problem yes that uh <laughs> like spotify a few years ago was busted because they created all these fake djs all these fake artists that they would basically pay a very small amount of money to uh you know some like fiverr based dj or someone just making beats for really cheap and then they would make these playlists and because that not that they pay the artists anything anyway but in in order for Spotify to pay them even less, they made all these fake artists and put them on these giant playlists so that they didn't have to pay them. Any. And it's just like, is that really what we want our, the kids of the next generation growing up listening to? Do we want them listening to the, the lowest common den denominator, like fake DJs? Or should we go a little back in history? And, and, and you know... <laughs> you folks who are not us Americans have a better uh, place to to stand on. You know, you you have traditions, you have ancient architecture, you have dances. Obviously, not every culture has this, but keep them alive is what I'm trying to say. All of those, you know, scribbled down notes that have precious family recipes on them from your your grandparents and great grandparents. Save all of those those crazy little dances that your family always does keep doing them make sure that stuff stays actually i just heard and i don't know who this this came from but it's uh it's a great guitarist and someone asked him <laughs> like, how did you come up with all these crazy tempos and rhythms that we would never think of and he's like oh i'm greek i i play greek music and it comes out in greek ways and we think in these amazing you know just like ridiculous rhythms that you would never come up with because you're american and americans don't they don't dance that way. They don't move that way. And so keep those things alive. And then, you know, from kind of on the other side of that, to keep growing, like, I don't I don't know how to process Greek rhythms and, and Greek dances, but I would love to learn. And, and when you go, and that's one of the reasons to travel. And if you can't do it in person, then listen to the music, eat the food, go to a local, uh, go to a restaurant that, that, you know, kind of artificially creates the atmosphere of that culture. Uh, whether it's yours or a different one you want to learn from, that's so important. So anyway, yeah, music has been very commandeered. So have movies. So has the internet. All of media. So it's up to you to kind of regulate your diet of good shit. <laughs> whether it's food, whether it's music or media, there are amazing movies out there. We watch them all the time and rewatch them all the time. Same thing with food. Same thing with music. Like some of my favorite musicians were born in the 60s or 40s. They've been dead for 50 plus years. Who cares? It's still great stuff. You could listen to that record, that album. You could look at that painting for the rest of your life and still be inspired or not get it or, or get something different from it by listening to it a few years later. So keep that in mind. It's up to all of us to as much as I, I love to complain about how bad things are that's not an original idea they are terrible whether it's all of that media so it's up to us to pick out the good stuff try to bring it back keep the old traditions alive the good ones anyone anyway that are worth carrying on and uh the second part of your question 
as far as frequencies go, I think is a really, really interesting one. Because we know for a fact that sound frequencies help or hurt our physiology. We've known this for thousands of years. There's a reason that in churches and in temples that, that music, singing, dance, smells, almost all of the senses all the time are built into these experiences. In the modern world, we've tried to segment everything. And if there's not published research that says 666 hertz is the best one to tune A's to, then obviously it's all hogwash or whatever. And it's like, <laughs> I think there, okay. So when you actually study music, which I did as an undergrad, and I got really into the science of, of psychoacoustics and how different frequencies affect us. Maybe I'll, I'll explain using a strange phen phenomenon of like subsonic frequencies below 20 hertz. You cannot hear them as a human. Some animals can. Elephants, uh, whales, and even we're understanding some birds can communicate great distances at almost with, with no delay because it goes so much more quickly through the ground uh, or, or water using infrasound uh, to communicate to use language we just don't hear it and we don't get it but we are affected by it big time so much so that there are stories of um infrasound these these low frequency sound waves can be generated by high winds funneling through the mountains sometimes or funneling through cities funneling through artificial or even natural places and so it it, it can make this kind of deep hum that you feel but you don't hear. And so there have been a lot of stories of, of hikers in particular places where the mountains are kind of set up in certain ways and the wind comes through at certain times, where in the middle of the night, even though it's like negative 20 degrees, people will take off all their clothes, run outside of their tents, just like howling with madness and then die from exposure. Um, and they, they wow. believe it's to get away from these deeply unsettling frequencies that are only arising because the wind is coming through in that particular way at that time. And that shows up in nature with communication, with hurting us through, through these various bizarre things. And, and a lot of strange phenomena, including ghosts in some circumstances, including like seeing orbs. And I believe in a lot of woo stuff, but some of this can be explained by the way that your eye vibrates according to certain frequencies. So if there is that strange house and the strange, you know, it's like these creaky kind of wheezing old houses with a woo upstairs always seem to be the ones with the ghosts. Um, not always, but I, I do think that's a really interesting phenomenon that our psychology is affected by the physiology that's affected by the frequencies that we can't perceive with our ears. But there's a lot more to hearing than just our ears. Wow. I didn't expect that at all. Wow. Makes sense. You know, that about the house and about the, the guys getting mad and all the, the people. It reminds me a few stories from my, my mother and my father. So they were telling me stories about their villages. There were always places, uh, some specific spots that everybody, the grandmas and the grandfathers were telling that there were, you know, witches there and uh, there were ghosts there. So they go, don't go there, children. And I was always, you know, fascinated because my father was telling me that, and my father is, you know, a rational person, let's say. He doesn't believe in who, like I do in some cases. He's a very, you know, uh, rational, logical uh, being. But he told me that, you know, a few places really were weird. So you felt weird. And he told me also that the wind and the noises were also very weird. Yeah. And probably it has something to do with what you said. So the, uh, it's fascinating. You can fascinating. also think How? of just the, the, the cliche of the opera singer shattering the wine glass. That's real. Like that happens. You can use sound to blow things up or to make things come together. If you look at, um, there are some experiments where, where they've, they've called cymatics, where you put um, a fine, fine grains of sand over a vibrating board and test different frequencies. And spontaneously, these different shapes, organized shapes will appear um, throughout the different frequency spectrums, uh, 
or spectra and and the way that it shifts according to frequency is so bizarre and so amazing it's kind of like it, it'll make different types of snowflakes depending on which frequency you use or it'll break those snowflakes up and then it'll reform into something else as you turn the frequencies and of course sound is multivariate we're getting everything all at once it's not like one sine wave and so even if we know that one side sine wave one pure sound does one thing it doesn't teach us that much about the giant system that we all live in and so it's important to recognize that if you're in a good groove and and you're honest with yourself and you're feeling like you're in the flow you want to dance and you're listening to to lyrics that make your your psychology feel good you know because there are some that are pretty dark you have to pay attention but um if you're grooving then it then it works if it sounds good it works and if it feels good it works uh, and and so i think it's more important to get caught up in that piece of it than necessarily saying that this frequency is the answer and this one is bad because as, as true as that is and it is true it's through experimentation and using a variety of different frequencies that stack on each other that we really get great music and great experiences. Yes, so many questions, so little time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'll try to prioritize a couple of more before we end. So, all right. So, fuck. Uh, all right, I have to sacrifice a lot of them, but let's go to the singing part because I know that you have a great voice. I mean, it's obvious to everybody listening. So before we start the interview, for example, I was listening uh, to a documentary uh, about uh, Mount Athos. So Ma I don't know if you know about Mount Athos. It's, uh, it's a mountain that's uh, for monks. It's a secluded area in northern Greece, um, you know, and it's a mountain full of monks and that's it. And the Orthodox Church uh, has a lot of uh, psalms, hymn, hymns, you know, uh, chants. Do, uh, have you ever listened to Orthodox Church, Greek Orthodox Church chants? Only a little bit, yeah. And I, I have a couple of great books that take sounds from different parts of the world, but only a little bit. So, yeah, I'll have to look into it after this. Yeah, yeah, I can send you a, a few that's uh, very good. So... It's the feeling, uh, because I, when I was younger, I was going, of course, to the church with my parents and all that stuff. And one reason I w always want, there are, there were a couple, three reasons that I wanted to go to the church. The first was the icon iconography. Mm -hmm. So Greek Orthodox Church has a lot of iconography, icons and all that stuff and paintings all over the place. So, you know, it's artistic. So that's beautiful. The second one was the uh, sense. So... The frankincense, they burn frankincense inside, so it's beautiful again. It's kind of, you know, you lose your yourself in, inside there. It's like traveling to another dimension. And the third, of course, was the psalms, so the chants. It was, I don't know what it was, but th these people singing, the men singing all together, the orchestra, if you can say so, uh, really fascinating thing. Uh, you were changing the vibe of the people inside the church and the, and you, when you got outside was tremendously different and i think the chants play a great role and they do because uh, in the orthodox church it's like uh, sacred so you always hear this chant so i want your opinion about singing uh, yeah what do you think about singing uh you know singing is like exercising your voice and we all know that we should be moving all of our bodies, but we speak within this narrow band. Even I do, you know, all day. I'm speaking between here. When I'm singing, I'm going, Whoa! you know, way up high and way down low again. And you, you get to experience and your body gets to resonate at all those different frequencies. When you're only speaking all the time in this narrow little band of frequency, it tires your voice out, certain muscles fatigue. I, uh, I almost had to do rehab on my voice with my singing voice after speaking, after doing so many podcasts, after doing so many speaking things, audiobooks, and all the rest of it, that, that certain muscles had fatigued and I had become a worse, a worse singer by speaking so much. And so I've, I've taken a couple years of, uh, working with different, um, uh, people who have become friends, but professional 
singers and professional uh, singing teachers to try to get more flexibility and more range back into my voice. And so uh, the most interesting thing about that to me is, is once you do sing in these different frequencies, you'll notice the different parts of your body resonate. So if you stood in front of a big speaker that's very bassy, you feel it in your chest. Same thing with amplifiers. That's one of the things I love about playing guitar and bass. So you feel that right in your chest and you can ex experiment with that. Um, but same thing happens with your voice, especially when you combine it with other people, the chorus. And you don't have to be a great singer to make a sound. And you won't be a great singer unless you practice and use your voice in the same way that you would never be great at running or, or playing football if you just never did it. <laughs> like, so people who say that they're not singers are, are lying to themselves um, with rare, rare exceptions. So practice, play, don't be afraid to make sounds, sing in the shower. You don't have to do it in front of other people, you know, but even humming along, just doing the ohms in your meditation instead of skipping them. Uh, chanting, if you can, if that's a part of your, your religious or spiritual tradition, like do that. That's great stuff too. But find a way to use your voice in a way that's not the unhealthy way that most people do now. You know, I, even I'm reading, I'm reading a book about uh, a Yiddish folk singer who's also a shepherd. And um, the writer describes how he uses his voice and he's, you know, just shouting and yodeling and screaming and screeching and bellowing and using all these sounds to control the herd of sheep and the, and the sheep dogs and they know what to do. And then he, he sings with people and he dances with people. And I'm just like, man, is that different from people just typing on their thumbs on Instagram and Facebook all day and, and making videos on TikTok? Like that's for the most part, people aren't making and I don't want to say that there's like low art and high art it's not really about that it's it's more about is what you're doing with your time making you better at your craft and do you want to be good at the craft of typing with your thumbs or making TikTok videos or do you want to actually get better at something that teaches you about other things cuz yeah maybe you can learn about life using TikTok but I I prefer the piano <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that was a good message for the for the countless girls uh, on TikTok. Probably the piano would be. A <laughs> we just lost step. all. The, we lost all of them long ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no TikTok girls uh, fans here, so no worries. Um, no offense to the girls there, but I think that you know uh, it's beautiful to have quality back. Bring quality back. Bring um, some of some traditions. You know, like you said, traditions in Greece. You know, when I listen to Greek music, Greek uh, traditional music, and dance the music, it feels kind of beautiful, and you connect with people. Who, the dances you hear in Greece are you you grab the other person, so you are in a circle. So the traditional dances are we form a circle and we dance, uh, and someone sings and so, and a few people play, and it's kind of you know like Dionysius uh, festival. It's beautiful. I mean, if you come here with your wife, I hope you do at some point, but you should you should probably try that to engage in what? some, yeah, if you go to Crete, especially in southern Peloponnese, in the Aegean Islands, wow, it's beautiful, the music, the sound, the, 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 the sun, everything, the sea, the wind, it's beautiful, Greece is beautiful, the politicians suck, but uh, Greece... That's true <laughs> everywhere, I think. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably. So I have uh, Abel. You were uh, you are very kind with your time. So I don't want to get more of your time. So one last question. Answer it shortly. No need to, to you know expand. So that's for a friend of mine. Uh, he told me to ask you, uh, what do you listen when you train, and do you think that music during training is uh, important? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, during certain parts of training, usually the hardest part. I will listen to music and I like to listen to things with a driving beat or kind of a funky upbeat type thing, which I think would jive well with, with Greek music, right? Like you could probably find a lot of things that would get you through a tough workout um, in, in a lot of cultures because there's kind of war music, there's funeral music, which is tends to be slow and kind of drags. There's the stuff that gets you ready for battle. Listen to the more stuff that gets you ready for battle. Like, uh, I, 
I don't know if Dragon Force is big over there, but maybe they are. There's there's like speed metal that I I don't really like that kind of music, but if I really need to get something hard done, I'll put on some shred guitar and listen to that. <laughs> wow, he will be so pleased to to, to hear that. So we. <laughs> We have the same philosophy, you know, uh, the same thing, war music, and uh, I personally hear to Cretan music. There is some specific, uh, uh, I, I can send you the files, you you will probably find them beautiful, yeah. Uh, very upbeat and uh, traditional, you know, manly. And so we have to, uh, unfortunately, to end this chat. Uh, I really enjoyed that uh, chat with you because um, you have your way to, you know, make it uh, relaxing. So I don't know what it is, but uh, probably your soothing voice, and that's why I have probably to practice my own voice after your uh, advice. So uh, I will listen to your advice, and I will start uh, singing when I shower. So I hope the neighbors don't call the police on me. <laughs> yeah, I'm so terrible now, but I'll do that. So able. I will ask you where, of course, can people find you? Yeah, yeah. You can find our uh, health-based work all at fatburningman.com. And that's where my podcast lives, uh, video podcasts. And we've got a, a lot of real food-based recipes there. And then abeljames.com, A-B-E-L, james.com, is where you find uh, <laughs> all of the wackier poetry and music and virtual reality tours and other things like that. So that that's the wacky ablejames.com and then Fat Burning Man, name of the podcast. You can find us uh, hopefully around the internet there, but always at fatburningman.com. Yeah, that's another conversation altogether. We hopefully, uh, I know, I know, I know some things about your situation. So I hope you are there still because you are a positive force. So I hope the best, man. And uh, please, if you can, stay for 30 seconds after we stop the recording. So for the for the viewers, for the people, thanks for listening to us and to James, to Abel. Uh, so go to Abel. Uh, Subscribe, do uh, go check his uh, fringes stuff. Uh, <laughs> I love them. I, I took a look about your 30, 360 things, so it's beautiful. And have a great day and see you in the next episode, I guess. So, ciao, ciao, everybody. <laughs>